This is Positively Farming Media. Hello, my gardening friends, and welcome back to the Just Grow Something podcast. As new gardeners starting out, there is a lot of information to take in, and it's hard to know what's important and filter through it all to get what we need. As we become more experienced and we move along in our garden journey, we begin to realize we don't know what we don't know. Soil testing was one thing I didn't know anything about, and when I did learn about it, I assumed it only had to do with nutrient content. While that is true in the sense of testing that we should be doing every single year, there's another test that we should be performing at least once in our gardens, especially when we're first getting started, soil texture and soil composition. I didn't learn about either of these until I was actually in undergrad for my horticulture degree. And if I'd known earlier how to check the texture and composition of my soil and how each one of those affects our garden differently, I guarantee I would have had more success earlier on, especially when we were moving and starting the gardens all over again. Different types of soil have different water holding capacities and nutrients move through them differently. So knowing what the texture of our soil is also helps us to know what the best amendments are for our particular soil and the plants that we want to grow. Today we'll talk about how to test our soil composition and our texture by using the jar method or the ribbon method and what the results mean for you and your garden. Let's dig in. Hey, I'm Karen, and I started gardening 18 years ago in a small corner of my suburban backyard. When we moved to a five-acre homestead, I expanded that garden to half an acre, and I found such joy and purpose in feeding my family and friends. This newfound love for digging in the dirt and providing for others prompted my husband and I to grow our small homestead into a 40-acre market farm. When I went back to school to get my degree in horticulture, I discovered there is so much power in food, and I want to share everything I've learned with as many people as possible. On this podcast, we explore crop information, soil health, pests and diseases, plant nutrition, our own nutrition, and so much more in the world of food and gardening. So grab your garden journal and a cup of coffee and get ready to just grow something. Before we dig into soil composition, I want to give you all a great big thank you. Thank you for supporting this podcast, for engaging with me on social media. Thank you for sitting through the anchor ads and uh, making purchases through my affiliate companies and buying podcast merch and for giving a few dollars a month over on Patreon. And thank you for recommending the show and sharing the episodes with people that you think will enjoy them. All of that has not only helped us reach 30,000 downloads, but it also enabled me to pull in enough actual cash to be able to buy a new microphone and a webcam. Nothing extravagant in either case. We're not pulling in thousands of dollars over here, but enough to be able to improve the sound quality of the episodes a little bit and enable me to put out a little bit more content for you on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and I'm slowly starting to get things low on the YouTube channel. My mission of spreading as much information as possible about gardening and how much power there is in food has slowly been coming to fruition over the past several years, and that is because of you. So thank you. And if you are continuing to get lots of value from the content that I put out and want an easy way to see all the ways that you can support the show, including all the free ways, I created a page that links all the stuff and all the things that you can do. So go to justgrowsomethingpodcast.com slash thanks. I'll link it in the show notes. All right. On to soil texture and composition. What are they and why is it important to understand what it is that we're working with in our gardens? So if you're a gardener who uses raised planters or containers exclusively, you obviously are in control of what is in those containers. This is really only going to apply to in-ground beds. But if you plan on breaking ground on an in-ground bed, then this is important information to have before you even begin. And then for those of us who aren't sure what we're working with or we think we know what we're working with, this is also something good to do. What exactly is our soil composition? You you may hear texture and composition used interchangeably, and that's appropriate because the composition of the soil is what defines its texture. Soil is made up of soil particles, organic matter, water, air, and then all kinds of those little living organisms. 
the combination of all of those things is really important to the overall health of the soil and in turn, the health of the plants that we grow in that soil. So the three primary soil particles that make up this composition are sand, silt, and clay. So the ideal soil composition is a very particular mix of those sand, silt, and clay particles. We call that loam. So if you hear the phrase loamy soil, that's like garden gold. That's the end-all, be-all, perfect soil to be growing in. Of course, in most cases, uh, the particles are not going to be balanced like that. Most of us don't have beautiful loamy soil, and the soil will need to be altered by adding organic amendments. And oftentimes, you might need to adjust what it is that you grow in your garden based on the composition. So let's talk about the properties of the different soil types. Soil texture is classified by the type of particle that makes up the majority of the soil. So each soil type has a distinctive textural feel and has different properties that make it more or less ideal for gardening. So let's start with sandy soil. Okay, in this instance, sand is the largest of the particles found in soil. It has a sharp edged material, which gives the soil a really gritty feel. When it's wet, that soil remains coarse and it breaks apart very easily. Beach sand is an extreme end of a sandy soil. Sandy soil holds almost no nutrients and it does not retain moisture well. So plants do not grow well in very, very sandy soil. Next, we have silty soil. Silt particles are smooth and they are smaller than sand particles. So when silt is wet, um, a silty soil will feel like mud. It's smooth. It has a very silky texture. It's rich in nutrients, but silt will retain moisture to the point sometimes where the garden plants are unable to get to oxygen. So in a very silty soil, plants can wilt basically because they can't breathe. They are oversaturated. And then there's clay soil. Clay is the smallest of the particles, and clay soil will clump and it will feel sticky when it's wet. Airflow in between the particles in the soil is very limited, if not non-existent. If you have clay soil, you will know because when it's dry, that soil has a very dusty feel to it and the surface is very hard and very dense. It makes it really hard to work the soil, either digging it or trying to till it. Now, even though clay is very high in nutrients, clay soil is obviously less than ideal for gardeners. The plant's roots may not be able to penetrate the dense soil to access the nutrients that are there, and it's also going to be very low on oxygen. So, of course, then we have loamy soil. Loam is the combination of all three of those particles in nearly equal proportions. It is a beautiful soil to garden in. The sand particles promote drainage and airflow within the soil. The silt are rich in nutrients and they aid in the moisture retention. And then, of course, you have the nutrient-rich clay, which balances out the poor soil retention of the sand and the excessive moisture of the silt. Here in Missouri, we have a lot of clay in our soil. And when we move to the property that we're on now, I just assumed the soil texture would be similar to what we were used to working with. Fortunately, I had to take several soils courses in college. And during one of those first classes, we had to do a soil texture test. So I went into one of my fields to conduct this test, and I was very surprised to find the soil was actually very loamy. That field and one other of them are situated on either side of a creek. So that not only affects the composition of the parent material that's deep in the soil substructure, which is what's responsible for what we're working with on the top, but it's also prone to being flooded by that very creek, which we unfortunately learned the hard way. That flooding is great for the soil texture, but it's not so great for the crops that you may have growing in those fields when it does flood every 15 years or so. But it means that we have lots of growing space that is way better suited for gardening than the remaining fields, which are definitely heavy clay soils. 
So how do you figure out what type of soil you are working with? To evaluate soil texture, you can use a simple jar test, and it's going to help you determine the actual percentages of sand, silt, and clay in your soil. Or you can use the ribbon test, which will help you to understand the soil texture in general without knowing the exact percentages of those components. And then once the percentages are calculated, you'll use what's called a soil texture triangle, and that can be used to determine the soil type. It all sounds very complicated, but I promise you it's actually very simple. So for either of these tests, you want to dig yourself a soil sample that takes a cross section of where it is that you are gardening at least four to six inches deep or up to 15 centimeters. Don't just scrape off a few inches of the top surface. You want to get a profile of everything that you are working with. So let's start with the jar test, and I'm going to put together a download that details both of these methods for you. I will link to it in the show notes. That way you have something to reference um, and walk you through step by step on how to do this. So for the jar test, you basically just need a straight edged clear jar. I generally just grab a mason jar. A permanent marker, a ruler, um, a watch or a stopwatch of some sort, about a tablespoon of either a powdered dishwashing detergent or just a real good squirt of a liquid dish soap, and then a mesh sieve or an old colander. So once you have your soil sample, use that sieve or the colander and sift the soil through it to make sure that you're removing any debris, any rocks, leaves, sticks, any large organic matter that's going to get in the way. And then take that soil and fill your jar about a third of the way through or a third of the way full of the soil that you want to test. Fill the remainder of the jar with clean water, leaving just a little bit of space at the top, and then add your dish soap. Put the lid on and then shake it really vigorously until the soil turns into this really uniform, like muddy slurry, okay? Sit the jar down on a level surface, and then set a timer for one minute. At the end of that minute, you're going to take your marker and place a mark on the outside of the jar, showing where that coarse sand layer has settled at the bottom of the jar. Yes, it only takes a minute for sand to settle, okay? Mark that spot, and then don't move the jar again for another two hours. Let it sit in that spot. Set your timer, come back two hours later, and you're going to mark that next layer. This is the silt layer that will have settled on top of the sand layer. Leave the jar in that spot for another 48 hours. Don't skimp on this. Make sure it's a full 48 hours because this is how long it's going to take the clay layer to settle. So after the 48 hours, you come back and you mark the top of that next settled layer with your marker. That's the clay layer that will have settled on top of the silt layer. Now, take your ruler and you're going to measure and record the height of each of those layers and then the total height of all three layers. Now you know what percentage of uh, sand, clay, and silt you have in this soil. Once you know this, you can use the soil texture triangle to find your exact percentages. So this triangle was developed by the University Extension Services. I, oh, no, I'm sorry. It wasn't Extension Services. It was the um, NRCS. And I will link to it also in the show notes, or it'll be in that uh, download that I will provide for you. Um, but essentially, it is a triangle that has um, the clay percentages listed on the left side, and the silt percentages on the right, and the sand um, percentages um, along the bottom. And what you do is you track those lines based on your percentages to find where all three of them cross in the middle. The region where those lines intersect on this triangle indicates the soil type that is present in your sample. And that that triangle is broken up into clay, sandy clay, silty clay, clay loam, loam, silt loam, all of the different percentages and all the different types of soil texture are listed in this triangle. And you will have an exact idea at that point of what your soil composition and your soil texture is. Now, if you just want a general idea 
of what your texture is. There is an easier, although it's a little bit more subjective, um, way to get results, and that is the ribbon test. So gather your soil sample and just lay it out on a plate or a tray and um, remove any rocks or pebbles or any bits of organic matter. And there's no need to really sift it like you do with the other method, but you do want to get any of the big chunky stuff out. You also want to make sure if there's any real big clumps, um, anything that we call those aggregates, any aggregates that are in the soil, you want to maybe crush those to get them down into the smallest parts possible. And then you're going to wet that soil. So just spray a small amount of water onto that soil and start trying to form it into a ball. Keep adding water a little bit at a time until it forms a ball. Now, if it's not possible to form a ball, then it's likely that you just have sand for soil. And so you know what you're working with there. For the rest of us, you keep adding water until you have the ball, and then start to knead that soil sample in your hand. Work it in your hand similar to the way that you would knead dough. Um, keep working it until there is no dirt sticking to your hand. It's all in a ball now that is no longer sticky, mostly smooth, kind of like silly putty or Play-Doh would if you roll it into a ball, right? And this is where you start to make your ribbon. I'm going to try to explain this as best I can. Um, I will include some pictures or some images in that download so you can see what I'm talking about. But you're going to start to turn this ball into a ribbon by squeezing it in your hand, same way like you would if you were holding the, the, the handle to a pot, right? And then press your thumb into that soil ball so that you're pushing it up over your index finger. You're squeezing the soil between your thumb and your bent index finger so that a ribbon begins to form. And as the ribbon grows, you just keep moving that mass of soil up in your hand and press your thumb to continue forming a ribbon. And you keep doing this until the ribbon eventually breaks. Once it breaks, you measure the length of the ribbon and write that down. Now, I recommend doing this several times and taking an average of those lengths. This is going to make sure that there wasn't some random piece of grit or a piece of something else that caused the ribbon to break prematurely. So, you know, three times usually is good, and then I will average out the results. Once you've recorded the length then check the texture and the feel of the soil. So take a small little piece of the ribbon about the size of a pea and put it in the palm of your hand and then add a pretty good amount of water to that soil so it becomes completely fully saturated in your hand. And then rub your index finger onto that little soil sample that's in your hand. Press your finger on your palm and rub in a circular motion so that you can really feel the soil texture. At this point, you want to classify how the soil feels into one of three categories, gritty, smooth, or neither. So gritty would be, you know, the sensation of, of rubbing dried sugar or sand or salt between your fingers. Smooth is going to feel like rubbing flour between your fingers, very silky. And then if it's somewhere in between, neither one of those textures dominates, then it's neither, right? Once you've figured out how the texture feels, you take that and the combina a combination of that and the, the soil ribbon length, and this is going to give you an idea of what your texture is. So if you have a soil ribbon that is pretty much non-existent, obviously you're working with sand, okay? Um, if it's between zero and one inches, like it's started to form something, but it's very, very short, then you typically have a sandy or silt loam with very, very little clay content. So if it feels gritty and it is very short, less than an inch, then you're working with a sandy loam. If it is smooth and is less than an inch, then you have a silt loam. And if it's neither gritty or smooth, then it is just loam. Nice, nice soil. Okay. If it's between one and two inches long, then you are working with some really nice loam. Um, if it's gritty, you've got a sandy clay loam. That is a nice combination of all three. If it's smooth, you have a silty clay loam, also a good combination. And if it's neither, then it's just a clay loam. Again, you're kind of right there in the middle. 
A ribbon that is longer than two inches has a heavier clay content. This is definitely my soil. So if it feels very gritty, it's a sandy clay. If it's smooth, it's a silty clay. And if it's somewhere in the middle, well, you're just dealing with clay. <laughs> so that's that's uh, what your results would be. That would tell you what basically what your soil texture is. And so after that, then you can match what you have determined to be your results to that soil texture triangle and get a general idea of the composition of your soil. But this isn't going to give you the precise proportions of sand, silt, and clay. To really know that, you have to do the chart test. But the ribbon test will give you a general idea of what you're working with and how that is going to affect the nutrients available in your soil. So what does all of this tell you about the water holding and nutrient holding capacities of your garden soil? First, let's talk about water. Soils that can store larger amounts of water obviously don't need to be watered as frequently as soils that store smaller amounts. So in general, sandier soils need rain or need to be watered more frequently than soils with a greater clay content. This is part of the reason why I can get away with not irrigating my large market gardens simply by applying a decent layer of mulch. The higher clay content in my soil holds water longer. But in the fields where my soil is loamier, I need thicker layers of mulch to achieve the same effect. And someone gardening in very sandy soil would need exponentially more mulch than I do and would likely still need to water unless they are also in a very humid area. Any plant will use water at the same rate regardless of the soil texture it's planted in, but it will run out of water sooner in a sandier textured soil. So if you have very, very coarse sandy soil, you have very little water holding capacity in that soil. If you have very fine sandy loam or silty loam soils, your soils can hold about an inch and a half to over two inches of water per foot of soil. That is almost ideal. But then once you get into like the clays, either the sandy clay or the silty clay, um, it can be upwards of two and a half inches. And then we start to maybe look a little waterlogged. So that tells you basically the water holding capacity. But what about nutrients, right? The next thing to know is what this means for nutrient availability. The composition of your soil changes how certain nutrients move through the soil. Now, there's a whole bunch of soil chemistry behind this that has to do with electrical charges and how those interact with soil nutrients and, you know, make them move more or less available to the plants. We're not going to get into that too deep. There's a That's really nitty gritty. But most soil scientists agree that 50 percent pore space, which is the space that's used for air and water, and ideally split equally between those two. So basically 25 percent air space, 25 percent water space, and then 45 percent mineral matter and 5 percent organic matter makes up an ideal ratio for garden soil. So the composition of your soil will dictate the amount of pore space that you have and the amount of organic matter. The more pore space there is, the faster water and subsequent nutrients are going to run through that soil. So basically, a sandier soil um, or the sandier soil is, the more nutrient poor it's going to be. Sand is composed of those large particles, and those particles are solid. They have no pockets where water and nutrients can hold to it, which is why it drains so quickly. And any nutrients that are dissolved in that water are going to flow through that soil more quickly and drain away, and that larger airspace allows the, the soil microbes to eat up a lot of that organic matter that the plants would use as nutrients. This is why if you have a very sandy soil, you need to be amending your soil with lots of organic matter to slow down the flow of water. Now, conversely, if you have very clay soil, your soil doesn't drain as quickly, which means, yes, you have a much higher water holding capacity, but you also have less space available for organic matter and the air that the plant roots need to survive. So if your pore space is 45% water and only 5% air, your plants are going to suffer. 
you too are going to need to amend with good organic matter to balance things out. You'll have plenty of water and nutrients, but the organic matter will be lacking in a clay soil. Now, you might hear advice that says add sand to clay soil to help it drain better. That's really tricky because too little sand and you'll end up making concrete and you're also not going to impact the composition of the soil. The amount of sand that you'd need to add to a clay soil to make a difference is substantial. And when I say substantial, I mean to change the sand content by 10%, which is what you would need to do to make a significant difference in that composition, you would have to add around 465 pounds of sand to a 100 square foot garden space. That's a quarter ton of sand. That is a lot of sand. And opposite of this, you'll hear recommendations for adding peat or vermiculite to sandy soils as an amendment. Yes, those amendments may increase the water holding capacity, but it's not adding any nutrient value to the soil itself. A much more economically feasible and much more sound method for improving any soil is to add organic matter like compost, um, well-rotted manure, grass clippings, cover crops, leaf mold, any of those things. Adding organic matter doesn't actually change the soil's texture. Remember, that's made up of the percentage of the sand, the silt, and the clay specifically. But adding organic matter will alter the soil's structure by modifying that pore space and improving drainage or increasing water holding capacity depending on your situation. So what it comes down to is knowledge. You can be a successful gardener with just about any soil texture, as long as you know the attributes and the limitations of that soil. And the only way to know that is to know what soil texture you're working with. I know there is a lot on your plate as a gardener and a lot to take in when thinking about everything in the garden, from planning to seed starting and transplanting, knowing how much of your chosen garden crops to grow and what it takes to grow them and what about pests and diseases. I know. And it it may seem like doing a soil texture test is just one more thing to add to the list and it may not be necessary. But if you've ever struggled with why certain things like carrots or beets won't grow well in your garden, or why your plants always seem to be struggling for nutrients, doing one of these tests may give you some answers. You might be surprised by what is actually in your soil or what's lacking. I hope this helped. I will see you back here on Friday for another Focal Point Friday. And in the meantime, my gardening friends, keep on cultivating that dream garden, and we'll talk soon. You just finished another episode of the Just Grow Something podcast. For more information about today's topic, go to justgrowsomethingpodcast.com where you can find all the episodes, show notes, articles, courses, newsletter sign up, and more. I'd also love for you to head to Facebook and join our gardening community in the Just Grow Something Gardening Friends Facebook group. Until next time, my gardening friends, keep learning and keep growing.